So we'll start with the traditional treaty land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the afforestation areas are situated in the West Swale Yorath Island Glacial Spillway, a sacred site in Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Those who entered into Treaty 6 are the Cree, Nahiawak, the Sotu, the Nakoda, the Yankton and Yankatoni people. May our relationships with the land, standing peoples, forests and waters teach us to honour and respect the past and invite us to move forward in harmony. May we all come together as friends to find inspiration and guidance from histories, languages and cultures which brought our understanding and community collaboration for the present and future. When and where did you see what? It's a great way to get out into nature and explore. I Naturalist is an online networking of people sharing biodiversity information, and it's also a crowdsourcing species identification system and an organism occurrence recording tool. Why do I use iNaturalist? It can be to get help with an identification if you have an organism that you're wondering, what is it? It's a great way to start your nature journal. It's a, definitely a fun way to learn about species identification. And it doesn't take long until you want to pop online and help others with their identifications. And we'll get more into that later. And it's an awesome app to use while you're traveling to find out what you're discovering in new surroundings. And it's also a great virtual armchair way to explore other countries. And it's a wonderful way to contribute to scientific projects globally. And there'll be more on that later too. So why does the Richard St. Barb Baker Afforestation Area and George Jenner Urban Regional Park uh, area in Saskatoon use iNaturalist? It definitely uh, creates a general species inventory. Uh, it's a great way to locate rare species and also remnant species. It's a great way to collect some seeds of native species. Um, it's a perfect way to identify areas of interest in nesting sites and it's also a good way to track invasive species. It's a wonderful way to get people involved identifying species, connecting with nature and building a community that cares. So why are you a naturalist? And as we go along we'll ask this question a bit later and it's, it's a very fun thing to explore what you'll be getting out of the iNaturalist app. The most common question is, what is it? After, why is the sky blue? But what is it? And here we have the nature deficit disorder. Richard Lou said, healing the broken bond between children and nature may seem to be an overwhelming, even impossible task. The environmental attachment theory is a good guiding principle. Attachment to land is good for child and land. So we will pause a moment here uh, just to identify the various um, images in this screen. And now if we put this one up, and take a moment to identify those images. Which one is easier? So as we get out into nature, we realize we cannot protect and manage what we don't know. That's one of the first steps in protecting the habitats of endangered species. iNaturalist facilitates the global sharing of expertise. Taxa don't respect borders. Knowledge sharing shouldn't either. 
iNaturalist has many advantages to you starting your very own life nature journal. iNaturalist makes it so easy and there's a whole community to connect with and learn with. Many of the people who add a lot of identifications on iNaturalist for other people do so in a way in a specific taxon. This little movie should work. And it's not right now. There we go. Um, so people around the world help other people with their observations. And that will intersect with geographic locations and local expertise. And the beauty of iNaturalist is that it uses all of these modes of contribution and expertise. The global sharing of observations and and expertise has allowed for a massive database of identified biodiversity images. Pokemon games were very popular in the late 1990s. The augmented world of virtual creatures like Pikachus, Pokeballs and eggs don't help scientists understand the world around us. However, discovering and spotting any number of organisms is enormously helpful. Realizing that you have taken a photo of a butterfly species at risk helps ecologists learn how maybe forest fires are displacing wildlife and what is happening in this area of climate change. There are also so many different areas of iNaturalist to explore. There's life lists, journals, hotspots of biodiversity, and we'll get into many of these as we go along today. Sorry about that. So learn a lot. Moss are rather like bird food with wings, wildlife biologist Sam Kieschick would say. If you want birds, you need moss. Moths are a crucial part of the food web. Moth diversity is directly cor correlated with plant diversity. When you can see just a glimmer of the sun going down, the butterflies are going to sleep. The moths are waking up. There are more to moss than the three types, the brown ones, the green, gray ones, and the black ones. Some moth species don't even have working mouth parts. They spend a lot of time as caterpillars eating. So as adults, they don't have to. When night temperatures rise above 16 Celsius, Kieschnick posts a white sheet outside and with a generator shines a light upon it, attracting the moths. moths spend the main portion of their life as caterpillars and only a very short time, perhaps a few days only, is how long they appear as winged creatures. Moths are attracted to light so they can find other moths to mate with. All forms of biodiversity have an interconnectedness with moths in some way. Bats, frogs, dragonflies, birds, and anything with backbones eat moths and baby hummingbirds subsist from moth caterpillars for food before they can pollinate flowers. Giving others guidance. This is part of the amazing crowdsourcing or communications feature. We all start with what is known when we learn something new. With natural history, start with what you know in the taxonomy kingdom, such as whether the organism is a plant, animal, fungi, or one-celled organism. From there, the taxonomic key breaks it down further. Quite often, when out in the field, we are so used to seeing what is around us that we can jump straight to the genus and say, oh, that's a wild rose, a dandelion, and so on. A naturalist lets us live vicariously through adventures. There's a tab in the computer version of iNaturalist called Explore. In this tab, one can search by many different features. One can take a virtual armchair travel trip to Australia, and you can become acquainted with all the unique biodiversity there, maybe before your next trip. Or perhaps you would rather explore the birds of South America, or the mammals of Africa, or the plants in northern Saskatchewan. This is how, from my naturalist loaded on your computer, from these various fields of entry, there are a multitude of ways 
to search for whatever you choose, whether it's an organism of biodiversity, time frames, observer names, places, and so on. As you start out on iNaturalist photogra photographing what is around you, various people are going to come along and make comments on your observation. Some will be experts in a particular kind of field, like perhaps Nathan Taylor, who maps, observes, and confirms mainly the Euphorbia genus, or the Spurge flowering plants. Some will be citizen scientists, like members of the general public, and others will be general biologists or naturalists. Here are four people who are actually curators or on iNaturalist. And as you go along on iNaturalist, you will see that it records the number of observations or photographs you take of biodiversity, how many have been identified to species level, uh, if you've created any list, how many identifications you've made for other people, if you've decided to write a journal post, which is, it can be a diary of anything, what you do during the day, how you join a project, or maybe something interesting you've learned about how to tell different species apart. It is so exciting to be a part of the big picture where one observation combined with men starts to make patterns and scientists can make predictions or take action for conservation. So on this map, you can see all the different observations made in Canada. Yes, we do indeed share this planet. And so much of the time we focus, say on the fact that Saskatchewan has a human population of about 1.2 million. Wouldn't it be nice to know what else was living here in Saskatchewan and whether their population was growing or declining? So how does a naturalist work? We have the observer in the field taking a photo of some living organism of biodiversity with their smartphone iNaturalist app loaded. The observer in the field will click on the what did you see field and view the suggestions that pop up magically by the iNaturalist image recognition technology. iNaturalist does the scientific journaling of date, time, and location. The observer presses the share button. Once the observation is online, then an identifier will come along. And sometimes there's more than one identifier and they will assist in ascertaining the name of the organism and confirm whether the iNaturalist smart identification technology was correct in their terminology as well. This process continues until the observation hits research grade with two out of three identifiers agreeing on the name of the species. So it is as easy as one, two, three. Download iNaturalist for your computer online. Download the iNaturalist app from the Apple App Store or from Google Play for your smartphone so you can go out into the field. Take a photo with iNaturalist open on your smartphone. An observation like this is a depiction of one organism. Here, there are three photos that we can see. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around there, of the same organism. And the iNaturalist app completes your natural history journal page with time, date, and place. When you are out in the field, take a lot of photographs. Take a photo on iNaturalist say of a plant, then click on the plus sign when looking at the very same biodiversity observation and continue with the plus sign until done with that particular plant, for instance. Some plants are identified by their stem and their prickles, like wild roses, genus Rosa. Some plants are identified by the undersides of their leaves, like currants and gooseberries in the genus Ribes. So click images of the plant and explore on plants everywhere. 
tops of flowers, bottoms of flowers, tops and bottoms of leaves, tops of stems and the bottom of stems, then the entire plant and the habitat where it lives. I naturalist is for observations of biodiversity, plants, animals, and other organisms. That being said, you can take pictures of feathers, nests, burrows, animal tracks, or things that just die, because those are evidence of living organisms. Saving species becomes as easy as one, two, oh, I'm going backwards for some reason. That's better. Saving species becomes as easy as one, two, three. Snap a photo of biodiversity, share it with a crowd of naturalists, and the discussion begins to narrow down the observation to species where possible. I am not an expert. I don't want to look like a dummy. So this is a potential dilemma for the newcomer, or even for the specialist. If one is a botanist with a speciality in bird watching, then how does one post an observation of a spider and leave it as an unknown? Here is where an eye naturalist comes to the rescue. Here we have the power of program coding. What kind of magical powers does this app possess? An orchid flower is discovered by the observer in the field. An eye naturalist using its magic comes up with species suggestions. Actually, the magic is a form of artificial intelligence using computer vision algorithms comparing photos to the database provided on iNaturalist. Each additional observation and identification further tweaks and refines the accuracy of the innate magic in iNaturalist. Or perhaps the observation is of a grass-like plant in the observation image. Now this could be grass, sedge, or rushes. Here, iNaturalist turns up a suggestion in the genus Carex, or sedges, and offers some species solutions to consider. For grass-like observations, there is a maxim which states, rushes are round and sedges have edges. Grasses are hollow with knees that bend to the ground. What have you found? Even if you don't know what you saw, starting with a general identification, like mammals, or spiders, or plants, these other suggestions will help experts to find it and, prog and progress to more specific identifications. Not everything can be identified to species level, and that's okay. This is a taxon tree. And again, start with what you know. The scientists who specialize will arrive at the unknown observation a lot quicker with just a tad of information. So rather than leaving the observation as an unknown, add plant or another larger taxonomic suggestion. Then others come to narrow it down further. Be bold. This is a part of identification etiquette on iNaturalist. Not sure? Place a suggestion of plants or flowering plants. And in the notes section, suggest goldenrod or rose or whatever, and that would be helpful. If you don't think you agree with the iNaturalist smartphone app suggestion. This is how to mark your observation as cultivated or captive not wild on your smartphone. Maybe you want to practice using a naturalist and decide to take a picture of your pet cat or dog, or maybe your potted house plant or garden tomato. If this is the case, you would just mark that it is a captive or cultivated organism. And this is how you would mark your organism on your computer as cultivated and not wild. So, do you have a photograph with more than one organism and you want to know 
both of them? That's easy. Just duplicate your observation. You would, in the notes section of the first um, observation, just comment that you're uh, interested in identifying the pollinator. And then on the duplicate observation, just mention that you're interested in identifying the flower. And the people will come along and know what you're aiming for, getting the name of. Join many projects when on your computer signed into iNaturalist. Two great projects in Saskatchewan are iMap Invasives Saskatchewan Project or the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre Project. There are other great projects also, such as the two for the afforestation areas, the Jenneru Park EcoQuest or the Baker Area EcoQuest. We will have more on projects a little bit later as well. They're a lot of fun. Hold on a minute. I said earlier that when you're starting your natural history journal, that iNaturalist would automatically record the date and the location. But sometimes it's not a great idea to make all the data known pub publicly. Sometimes a species at risk could be devastated if disturbed or picked if it's a flower that was picked to extinction, you may allow projects to see the location if you desire. So if I signed into the Saskatchewan Data Conservation Centre with the intent of registering species at risk, I could allow that project to know the location, but not the general public. Or I map invasives so that the invasive species could be somewhat controlled. Perhaps you have, this is what would happen if you did select your geo privacy selection. Um, three choices appear, whether it's open, obscured, or private. And um, open is what is always on iNaturalist by default. And iNaturalist is actually just changing up its programming right now so that species at risk automatically go to obscured or private. The thing is, if you are going to set it to obscured or private to protect the species at risk, it's a good idea to make all of your observations for that day the same setting, because it's kind of easy to extrapolate if you were at point A on the path, and then point B becomes obscured, and then point C a little bit further down the path is again publicly known. It can be kind of figured out that the species at risk might be in between. The two. So this is what happens when you pick the different geo privacy um, settings. Open gives a pinpoint and it goes right down to the latitude and longitude. Obscured kind of gives, oh, it's kind of in this area in the province. And private, no one knows at all. So um, let's say that you were taking a picture of your pollinator garden in your front yard and you didn't want people to know exactly where it was then you could set it to private. So right now, at the current moment, there are 17 species at risk found in the afforestation areas. The afforestation areas are a unique ecotone between boreal forest-like settings with the mixed woodlands and the native moist mixed grasslands. So our species at risk need a habitat from both of these settings. Oh no, perhaps you think that your photographs just aren't good enough. Well, there are some hints and tips here as well. The best of the best tip and trick is to snap a lot of photos. Try to get as many angles as possible, say of insects. Try to get as many various poses also of plants as possible. Now if it's an insect, you may be hard pressed to get very many images of the same insect before it flies away, but do what you can. A flower is a little bit more easier to get many photographs of. And again, I'll just say different plants need different places for their taxonomic identification to species level. 
such as the top or the bottom of the flower, the bud, the tops and the bottoms of the leaves, what the stem looks like, the entire plant, and where it's living in its habitat. Tips to get better observations. Get up close. It's okay if it looks like a common species. For instance, there are three species of dandelions in Saskatchewan, and one of these is a species at risk. Take many angles, up close, and of the entire organism. Remember to replace any disturbed microhabitats. For instance, if you were going to take a picture of the moss on the bottom side of the tree, you might take a little bit off just to get a close-up picture of all the different parts of it and then gently put it back where you found it so it can reattach. Try to crop your picture so that the organism takes up 70% of the screen so that the iNaturalist image recognition technology can work with a greater degree of efficiency and accuracy. Here are some other helpful tricks and tips so that folks making the ID know whether your organism is huge, medium-sized, or small. Check your pockets. If you don't happen to have the ruler or measuring tape with you, select a coin and put it beside the more organism, because everybody knows the size of a dime or a quarter. Bring along a magnifying glass or jeweler's loop for an instant close-up image. Bring along a white cloth or a white piece of paper to place behind your organism to help separate it out from the background. This is especially helpful for the small, fine parts of an organism, like the top of a grass. If you don't happen to have a white cloth or a paper with you, place the organism in front of your pant leg or shirt sleeve, and this also works. There are so very many different common names for organisms at times. Here, there is personal. There can be many different regional names for the same plant. However, the taxonomic name remains the same throughout all the differences. The first name, Portulaca, is the genus name, and the second is the species name. So why, oh why, does my observation still say unknown. Why isn't this crowdsourcing working? The community ID system can be done by anyone and you may choose to remain an observer taking photographs in the field or you might wish to take it to the next level and become an identifier. When you become an identifier your natural history knowledge increases by leaps and bounds as you get out of it what you put into it. Here again, one may start out with the larger identification such as butterflies and moths, order Lepidoptera. One sneaky thing is, perhaps you have taken an observation of a spider and you just list it as a spider. Then an entomologist comes along to suggest that it looks like an ant mimic sack spider. And then you take that genus Castanera and look that up in the Saskatchewan Data Conservation Centre Invertebrates Data Report, and it turns out that there are only three species of Castanera in Saskatchewan, narrowing down the search and the taxonomic discovery in the Keys enormously. And just like Saskatchewan has charts of the different organisms existing in our province, so does Manitoba and Ontario and Alberta, and so therefore it's easy to funnel down your observation in those areas as well. The internet is very rich with knowledge right now. An example of an observation changes from casual with just your observation or the iNaturalist identification and it changes to research grade when at least two identifiers or two out of three agree on a particular taxon identification. The observation also needs to have the date, photo or sound, and have the GPS location and be marked as wild to become research grade. 
So here, on the outside of Monaco, two identifiers have confirmed that they believe that this observation is a pink barren strawberry. Here is another unique and fun opportunity to connect with the community discussion. The dashboard comes up in your email or on your computer when there are observations of the people you will follow. This provides you an opportunity to, to interact. Maybe you want to favor their observations. Maybe you want to try your hand at ident identifying it. Or maybe you just are amazed that it is located there. If you're wondering, for instance, if you're in an area where um, garter snakes might um, come out of their hibernaculum in the spring from their winter hibernation. You can be watching garter snakes on iNaturalist and you get a pretty good idea of what hibernaculums around the province are, are when, when it's getting warm enough for them to come out of hibernation. Now then, another helpful way to receive identifications from the computer vision prediction system is to double check the settings on your computer and ensure that you are affiliated with iNaturalist Canada. As the species suggested in iNaturalist Canada are those which are common to Canada. There are so many branches of iNaturalist around the world. It is just amazing. Here are some wonderful resources on iNaturalist Canada from this listed webpage. iNaturalist works on a wonderful community level, which makes it seem like magic. From genus to species, you as an observer can delve into learning taxonomic keys. And it comes in handy to have the organism identification from kingdom to species level. Here, are a small sampling of some internet sites. Besides the taxonomic keys, the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Centre again has the listing reports of all biodiversity in Saskatchewan. And it also has online guides on iNaturalist, very similar to picking up uh, a flower book, a flower identification book from a bookstore. Um, but it's on iNaturalist as a, an online guide. And there are also other online guides of information in addition to field guides put out through the Nature Society of Saskatchewan and the Saskatoon Nature Society. For instance, if my photograph of an insect did not come along with a handy identification for a while, I might take the same photograph and go to the bug guide website and post my insect there to see what the suggestion might be. Or if I had a flower that did not go past unknown, I might check out the Sask Wildflowers website put online by Glenn Lee. He provides many different photos of flowers in all the different stages. He's somebody that does take pictures of the flower, then the leaves, then the stem, and he describes the height and the size of it very well on his website. On Facebook, there's an amazing Saskatchewan mycological working group if you don't have a mushroom that's come to identification for a while. And there's also an amazing web page called The Mosses of Saskatchewan from Biodiversity Saskatchewan. I should have included a few more items from other provinces, but I rather focused on Saskatchewan. Sorry about that. So for the afforestation areas, we also have three hotspots for the Richard St. Barbaker afforestation area. One focuses on the wetlands, and then we have another hotspot to the east and to the west of the, of the hotspot. Now eBird would help anybody in any province as well. So if you have taken a picture of a bird somewhere, or if you have recorded the noise, you would have to use a different website for sound. eBird just does the identifications. But the hotspot does list the birds that are in that hotspot. So if you're near that hotspot, where you are making your observation, 
you can check out the species list there and, and compare your picture of a waterfowl or a sparrow to what they have and, and you can narrow it down quite a bit. Now Seek is another amazing app for the younger crowd. Now anybody at all can answer the question, what is it? This is how it works. They just point the phone at the plant or organism or insect and it uses the iNaturalist database of images to bring forward a suggested name for whoever is pointing the phone at whatever they're looking at. Now these are the differences between using Seek and iNaturalist. Seek is kid safe and is gamified to give badges and rewards for being out in the field looking at things. It's kind of like a Pokemon game with nature. But if you want to help out the scientific community and add to the data worldwide, then iNaturalist is a better choice for you. It's, it's an easy way to get into conversations and uh, save your observations and uh, we'll get them later even. So why are you a naturalist? We come back to that question. Is it to sharpen your mental acuity, to sharpen your brain power and sensory awareness, become more aware of nature around you? Is it to develop a connection of how to be out in nature and how to develop a tree sense? Perhaps your interest is to take care of the earth as a steward or as a guardian. What's your reason to become a naturalist? David Attenborough, and Richard St. Barbaker are dedicated to their fields. The larger of the afforestation areas in Saskatoon is named after Richard St. Barbaker, who lived for between 1889 and 1982. He has been called the first global conservationist, and in recognition of this, he was made the first honorary life member of the World Wildlife Fund, and in 1969 awarded the honorary the Order of the British Empire and an Honorary Doctorate of Laws from the University of Saskatchewan. Baker achieved so very much as a conservationist and as an earth healer through his lifelong planting of trees. Providing input in the form of observations is so very greatly appreciated. It helps the process along and starting out with on an identification is wonderful. Even if it is on identifications to flip some unknowns into plants or animals. This is so helpful. And even extending welcomes to new observers is amazing. While one photo is a wonderful way to start a scientific life list of observations in your natural history journal, many photos forward the work of ecological assessments, scientific study of seasonal or phenological changes during climate change, the conservation of species at risk, and promote the attention to invasive species. Now, to go into this a bit further, a bird watcher, iNaturalist user, Tracy K2, was out at the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve in California for some bird watching. While out, she decided to look around at the other biodiversity, which weren't birds, and she took images of some fiddler crabs scampering about and placed a suggested name as a species founded, found in that area, the Mexican fiddler crab. Then, during the identification phase, a second look by world experts on fiddler crab systemics realized that the observation lent itself to be closer to the large Mexican fiddler crab, never before seen in the United States. So the observation by Tracy K2 placed this species about 240 kilometers north of its usual habitat. So it was appreciated and an amazing and fortuitous, exciting observation to have recorded. The elm zigzag sawfly first was detected in the summer of last year in Quebec on iNaturalist by Alain Hogue, an etymologist by the name of Charlie Eisman himself an expert and author of Tracks and Signs of Insects and Other Invertebrates and Leaf Miners of North America, came along to do an identification on the generic 
butterflies and moss identification suggested by Hoke. Seisman referred the observation right away to an expert in Germany and to another expert in the United States, who also confirmed it as the elm zigzag sawfly. This Asian invasive pest can cause entire elm trees to lose their leaves, and this happening continuously can cause a weakening and decline of the elm tree. From there, this random observation in Quebec made it into scientific journals as the first time that it was seen that the elm zigzag sawfly jumped over the ocean. Now then, where Dutch elm disease has ravaged many areas across North America, with that pandemic sweeping along taking out elm trees, we are surprised by elm survivors, which are now anomalies in many places. Dutch elm disease is a destructive fungal infection of elm tre trees, spread from tree to tree by elm bark beetles. The fungus clogs the tree's water conducting or vascular system, causing the tree to have flagging or yellowing of the leaves across the tips of the branches at the top of the canopy. Healthy plants resist insects who are only ever attracted to sick, to sick plants. Insecticides, pesticides, fungicides, they all weaken the plant. The best way to make a plant insect proof is to increase its health and encourage rich soil. Elms are protected by pruning bands between April 1st to September 1st so that wounds do not attract insects. A healthy elm with the proper amount of composting, water and balanced nutrients is much more likely to resist the elm bark beetles arriving than sick injured elms or cut elm firewood. So this is more protection for the elms, the ban on not transporting elm firewood from place to place. That just gives the Dutch elm beetle a free ride to a new location. Another observer on iNaturalist, Scott Tregezer, a photographer and herptologist, took many photos of invertebrates and decided to post them on iNaturalist and labeled it as a gastropod or snail. Soon John Stapinski, a biologist of mollusk collections in Chicago and Florida, came around and added the observation to the family of cyclophoroid snails. Though Tregesser had an interest in reptiles and amphibians, he was pretty sure somebody on iNaturalist would be able to identify his little snail. Two years later, a, re a researcher named Jun Kit Foon, a Malaysian malacologist specializing in Southeastern Asian snails, saw this observation on Google when he was searching images for Southeast Asian land snail pictures. On iNaturalist, Foon commented, this is the first ever photograph of a living snail of Myxostoma pitivinarium wood 1828, discovered way back in the 1700s during the South Sea voyages of James Cook. Foon poured over historic literature and hand-drawn illustrations to confirm the identification in his excitement with this discovery. Juanada 037 or Daniel Vasquez Restrepo took more than one observation of a gecko in Colombia. And after much conservation with Charlie Yi, Ying Yod Wang, who is a naturalist at the Natural History Museum studying specifically hemidactylus or house geckos, it was determined that this specimen was not the Asian house gecko, but rather the first time ever Colombia had seen the Indo-Pacific house gecko. The Restrepo confirmed the ID through the chin shield, which was a determining factor listed in the taxonomic keys and called in other gecko botanists. This is a report from Michael Moore, a graduate biology student who used iNaturalist photos to study the color of dragonfly wings. The observation correlating coloration to climate change may affect breeding patterns should the females not recognize another dragonfly of her species due to the dramatic differences in wing markings. Katarzyna Nowak and her colleague, 
put out hidden, hidden wildlife cameras at mineral licks to study mountain goats. They looked at zoos, sought out citizen science photos of mountain goats to study the shedding of their winter coats in the spring. Nowak said, so when do you take your winter coat off? Compared to when a mountain goat takes its winter coat off. We can take off our coats when it gets warm. They can't. Nowak further says, my grandmother in Poland used to wear fur coats, but she doesn't wear them anymore because it just doesn't get cold enough to need them. Even for people who don't follow climate science, or who have their doubts about our influence on the climate, the fact that your heavy coat has been in the closet for the last five years, now that is something you notice. So it is indeed a powerful network of crowdsourcing, scientific projects, and collaboration in the detective work which goes into identifications. It is an intriguing real-life game of Pokemon Go or Where's Waldo for observers who become more and more tuned into their surroundings. iNaturalist curator Scott Laurie, a developer working on iNaturalist, says that natural history really is a game. It's going out there and trying to learn as much as you can about the things that you're finding in nature. Our digital and smartphone cameras can do so much more than take selfies around the world. The photographs of biodiversity contain important ecological, seasonal, or phenological clues to learn about our ever-changing planet. Now, the iNaturalist Forum is a place to discuss iNaturalist-related topics. You can report like computer programming bugs, you can request new features, you can help with translations for other languages. You can add the common name in your particular area and so much more. The iNaturalist Forum is a great place to explore what's being talked about. iNaturalist is an amazing resource for scientists in a diverse array of fields. They can track changes, ranges, the phenology, and so much more. iNaturalist is fun. Discover more on iNaturalist, including fun projects. Join the Name Game Project and connect your observation, which has an interesting, odd, absurd, or awesome name. Boop Boops, Edible Monkey, Sword Bearing Conehead, Wahoo, The Sorcerer, The Brick, these are just a few of the submissions to date. Sounds like a lot of fun. The Observational Comedy Project invites observers to attach their observations to the project, which are a bit unusual looking, are not so serious biodiversity observation. Another project, Welcome to Gerald's of the World project, brings together the funniest observations out there. If the observation or the social networking is funny, it belongs in this project. There are projects for Never Home Alone, the wildlife of homes, the bus stop observations, or human faces and masks in nature. Now, when is a ladybug like a cat? When is a caterpillar like a bus? When is a dragonfly like a cargo plane? Answer, whenever any of these organisms is carrying unwanted passengers or parasites. If you think that this is fun, join the passengers Parasites Taking Rides Project and explore the observations or just add a few of your own. Another project is entitled Organisms On or Near Appropriate Signs highlights the serendipitous chance encounters when biodiversity interacts with human signs. It's just those silly coincidental connections. Richard St. Barbaker said, We feel that our greatest victory remains to be won when man will realize his oneness with the trees, the creatures, and with all living things. Not ours to destroy, but to be handed on for the enjoyment of future generations. 
getting more help is available. iNaturalist has a frequently asked questions page. They have the forum. They have a general support email. And so it's very easy to find help when you want to get onto iNaturalist. There's also greeters that are wanted. So if you ever want to go on iNaturalist and just put out a welcome greeting to new users, that is enormously helpful. Want to practice? There is a BioBits or a Nature Connect still coming up this fall. A BioBits is basically an event where groups of people can be ordinary citizen scientists, teachers, students, groups, or any community member, where they come together at a certain date and time and try to find out just as many species as possible in a specific area. A great way to participate and record the species accurately is through the iNaturalist app. So it is blitzing with an energetic concerted effort on one task to find biodiversity, hence BioBlitz. So this Sunday at two o'clock Central Standard Time at Richard St. Bar Baker Air Force Station area, we'll meet at the Southwest off Beach Recreation Area and explore the neighboring forest and have a lot of fun and get to learn the iNaturalist app and learn a little bit of the cultural, geographical history of the area. It is an unprecedented time for biodiversity observations when community science or participatory science gets involved. Research questions find answers. Climate change and how it affects flowering duration or unusual flowering events are recorded not just singly, but across whole continents, making the seasonal collection of data, the phenolo phenology monitoring data clear, clear. This is one of the sessions for National Forest Week. There are two upcoming sessions still coming. On Saturday, we'll have the parks session where the pres National Prescription in Nature program has arrived. And then on Sunday, there will be an introduction to biophilia. And then we'll have the Forest Connection Walk Sunday at two. Also stay tuned for our virtual event on November the 6th at one o'clock Central Standard Time, which is UTC minus six. We're going to explore the heritage and legacy of a great humanitarian conservationist in a heritage documentary film with specialists from around the world um, speaking at it. So this is where the afforestation areas are located in Saskatoon. Sometimes we call them Saskatoon's hidden forest treasures or Saskatoon's best kept secrets. They're located inside the city limits, just on the southwest, southwest edge of town. So if you have a moment to come out, you can do I naturalist on your own without being in a biobits group? Or if you want to have some fun and connect with other people, it's a great place to socially distance because George Genru Park is 148 acres and Richard St. Bart Baker is 326 acres. So even with COVID around, there's a bit of room to keep, keep abiding by the COVID protocols. So that's all we have for tonight. I wish to thank you for your time and uh, I'll, I'll open it up for any questions anybody might have. You can either write them in the chat group or you can unmute yourself and just ask them. Oh, it looks like we have uh, someone in the chat group already. So yes, the Elm zigzag sawfly is a very new species. We had been very worried about uh, Dutch elm disease for elm as well as the green ash the ashes are being affected also by insect infestations. But yes, it's very good to watch for that zigzag patterns in the leaves of the elms, for sure. And, and how where it's heading from Quebec, that's for sure. Are there any other questions or comments?
Well, hearing none, I think maybe this session is over. I hope you, oh, cool, another comment. Oh, thank you very much. Someone commented that it was very interesting and they learned several new things about our naturalist. So that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that, that that happened and I, I hope you enjoy using our naturalist and going forward. It's, it's very amazing and, and a very rewarding thing to use for sure. It's a very powerful tool. So have a good evening, everybody. Yes, quite often it is quicker than bug guide. It depends, I guess, on the bug. Sometimes bug guide comes forward, but the neat thing, the difference that I have found between bug guide and iNaturalist is, is if bug guide has many pictures of a certain bug, it will um, delete um, your bug picture in a short order. So if you're not really keen on watching, if anybody's given an identification, it's going to be gone. So you don't really learn a lot from it, but iNaturalist keeps it in, it, whatever you put in your natural history journal, it stays there. So you get to refer back to it. And I find that handy for myself. If I've made an identification or taken some time taking it through the genus to the species level and all that, and I've written myself notes for how I did that, it's always going to be there and someone's not going to delete it later on. So my notes will always be there to, I can search my own observations and look at where I've been and, and go back to it and, and, and know what I was thinking a few years back. So that's handy. And thank you. Thank you for coming. Cool. Have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>